rebuild that home for our grandchildren's sake. Let's rebuild that home for our grandchildren's sake. We're overextended, we're stretched to the max, expecting our grandkids to pay it all back. To bankrupt our nation is a tragic mistake. Let's bring home our troops for our grandchildren's sake. Let's bring home our troops for our grandchildren's sake. Our bridges and highways are falling apart. Some leaders in Washington don't have a heart. They spend all our money on killing and hate. Let's rebuild that home for our grandchildren's sake. Let's rebuild that home for our grandchildren's sake. Our wars are atrocities driven by lies. At home we let job loss and poverty rise. What kind of a world do you want to create? Stop waging these wars for our grandchildren's sake. Stop waging these wars for our grandchildren's sake. It's coming. Freedom is coming. Freedom is coming.
Reverend Todd Weir. I am one of the five pastors of the worshiping communities that make up First Churches here. And I welcome you to our meeting house in the greatest of the New England traditions where uh, for more than four centuries, Congregationalists and people gathered at the meeting house at the Town Green in New England communities to discuss the issues of the day and make important decisions. And we're evoking that tradition here tonight. This meeting house uh, was first established in 1661. That means that the people of Northampton gathered a hundred years before there was such a thing as Congress. More than a hundred years before there was a country called the United States of America. And they practiced democracy. And this is how they learned about citizens' participation and give and take and gaining a vision and listening to one another. It was going on and a long time ago. And so we know that the center of political gravity is not at Beacon Hill. It is not in that place. It's not in that place in Washington, D.C. that was known as the Foggy Bottom before they built the Capitol on it. The center of political gravity in this country is at the grassroots where people like you gather together and dream dreams and share their visions and talk to one another. And that's what we're doing tonight. We're evoking the meeting house and making it real for the 21st century so that it's more inclusive. Inclusive of people of all religions and people of all non-theistic traditions, of men and women and people of all ethnicities and races and sexual orientations, truly making it we the people. So let us listen. Let us speak to one another. Let us listen. Let us hear the words of hope. Let us dream the dreams of justice as we are here together to be we the people. Thank you so much in advance to all the organizers, uh, American Friends Service Committee, Raging Grannies, all the speakers. And without further ado, I'd like to welcome Packy Wheeland. I could say so many things about Packy. She's a part of the Raging Grannies. Um, but the most important thing I can say is she is a courageous woman of peace. tonight's guest speaker. So just for those of you who don't know the history of the idea of our being here, um, it's the Raging Grannies who came together. We came together about a month ago, or a little less, and said, what are we going to do? It's pretty awful, isn't it, what's happening in our country? And we decided that we actually have a different vision of what's happening in Washington, and that we would come together, invite speakers, invite listeners, invite speakers and listeners, all of us together, to come together to share our visions, and to not only share these ethereal visions, but our visions that we have already begun to put into practice, and some of which have been in practice for a number of years. So we'll hear more about what one another is doing in very brief vignettes and, uh, and hopefully leave here encouraged, knowing that, as Todd Weir just said, uh, the center of the moral compass of this country is not anywhere but in each of us and all of us in our community, because we are one of those centers of the universe. So thanks for being here on this miserable night. Avani Seth is a professor at Hampshire College, and uh, we are very pleased to have her with us tonight. She is going to share some of the ideas that you may have read in her books, that you may have seen in her salon.com articles, um, and if you haven't read her in either of these places, please. She is a wonderful woman who is wise beyond her years, and, uh, and will give us some of the good theory that sometimes I know as an activist, I forget theory periodically and, uh, and just keep spinning. And so I'm very pleased to welcome our speaker and uh, thank you for coming. I'm 
uh, try to oblige. Uh, I wanted to thank Patrick Leland, I wanted to thank Jeff Napolitano, the uh, Amherst Gospel Choir, and the Raging Grannies for such an inspirational beginning to this meeting. And to all of you who are here on this quite horrible, snowy New England evening. Uh, I'm quite humbled to be here with you because when uh, Jeff and Packy invited me uh, to speak with you, I thought, well, what do I know about activism? I'm a philosophy prof. I write a couple things here and there, and I'm still not convinced that I have anything that worthy to say to you. Uh, I think it really, for me, the task is more to listen to you tonight, so I look forward to doing that. But I will say a couple, a couple of things, if you'll permit me. As we know, the 114th Congress is ushering in a fairly dismal set of politics and representatives. November 2014 showed the lowest percentage of voter turnout in 72 years. At 36.3%, it was nearly half of the percentage of voter turnout in 2008, which was 61.6%. The New York Times thought that the reason we had the lowest voter turnout in 72 years was because of nasty campaigning on the part of the Republicans, and that the Democrats did nothing to combat it. So here's what they said. The reasons are apathy, anger, and frustration at the relentlessly negative tone of the campaigns. Republicans ran a single thing. ...by the economy, or to point out significant achievements of the last six years. Well, I'm not sure what those significant achievements were, to be honest. But I do agree with the Times when they say neither party gave voters an affirmative reason to show up at the polls. I think that's true. I think voters, they vote when they have reason to believe that their votes will bring about change. And so they voted for hope and change in 2008. They believed that the first black president and a Democrat would somehow bring an end to some of the horrible actions set in motion by their Republican predecessors. They hoped, I think, for the end of warrantless surveillance, the end of preemptive policing, that normalized the practice of profiling minorities in the name of the so-called war on terror. They hoped for the end of torture, otherwise known as the Enhanced Interrogation Program, the end of the war in Afghanistan, the end of Guantanamo Bay, detention facilities, the end of ceaseless attacks in Israel, the end of homelessness, the end of poverty, the end of all kinds of uh, wrongdoings, repeal of various laws that were intended to regulate the banks. But the November 2014 elections found us in some of the same terrible predicaments. The White House's high-level drone campaign in Pakistan and Yemen, the conviction and imprisonment of Chelsea Manning for whistleblowing, the continued secrecy of the details of the widespread programmatic surveillance campaign, which were illuminated by Edward Snowden, among others, the White House's attempt to block the release of the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence's torture report, or what I call the Torture Enacted Against Muslims report, Team USA, the 141 detainees that were still in Guantanamo in November, Many others. As you, as some, those of you invited me know that I'm not really a happy, upbeat person. I don't do that, but I'll try eventually. <laughs> the deaths of Michael Brown, Kojima Powell, Eric Garner, Miriam Carey, at the hands of police in Ferguson, St. Louis, Staten Island, Washington, many other places. Unprecedented levels of deportations of undocumented migrants. 2.6 million migrants in six years. But it also found us with some amazing accomplishments, pushed at the local level by local activists. And we've seen a lot of this here and nationally. Organized political protest on the issue of police violence and brutality, nationwide attention to the issue of drone strikes led by Code Pink, among others, and joined by black leadership and other groups, nationwide attention to the issue of black men and women in prison at epidemic rates, Illuminated, illuminated again by various groups, by anti-prison, anti-black violence organizations, some of whom um, are led by some of my colleagues of Hampshire, including Professor Chris Tinson, Professor of African American Studies, and my students, some of whom are here, 
active in the decolonization media collective. The release of the Senate Select Committee's intelligence torture report, finally, which was released at 550 pages, which allowed us to have a sustained and blunt discussion of what should be obvious. That even if torture was legalized, it is immoral and it should be non-existent. Some progress on the issue of same-sex marriage rights. Challenges to the alarming rate of deportation of undocumented migrants finally slowing down in 2014. So what do we make of all of this? As a new year starts, and again, I, I, I warn you, I'm not a happy person. <laughs> I've been thinking a lot about the idea of evil. I've been thinking about evil actually for the better part of 25 years. I don't like it, I don't like the term. Not because there isn't such a thing as evil, but because I think the term evil is often a conversation stopper. It's a brain stopper. The idea of evil can be projected onto an inhuman monster. A Darth Vader, sorry, I'm an 80s kid. Or the Riddler, or the Joker, or Hannibal Lecter. And that projection displaces the blame and stops us from asking how evil can occur. In some sense, in many senses, this, this is the strategy of the police with regard to black men and women and violence. This is the strategy of the feds with regard to Muslim men and women. This is the strategy of both the feds and states with regard to Latino and Asian migrants and racial profiling. It's to depict them as evil. It's to depict them as a threat to democracy. But we know that's not where evil lies. We know that evil doesn't lie in people. It lies in the dehumanizing of people. It lies in logics that dehumanize. It lies in logics that dehumanize people of color, women, gays, lesbians, transgender folks, children. It lies in the logics that dehumanize vulnerable people. One of my favorite philosophers writes in her book, I've Been in Jerusalem, that is Hannah Arendt, that evil is banal. It's every day, it's quotidian, it's about not thinking, it's about con being conventional, it's about bureaucracy. In short, evil has the potential to rear its ugly head within each and every one of us. But the good news, I told you I was going to get there, <laughs> is that if evil is banal and everyday and conventional, then evil is also stoppable. But in order for it to be stoppable, it has to be findable. And that means the search for evil isn't in the search for persons, but in the search in the everyday things that we may or may not be aware of. It means looking at our own practices, finding the connections that aren't made, breaking the connections that don't really exist, and looking at the details. To that end, I have four ideas that I want to share with you. The first is this idea which has become popular of late, but I have my own take on it, called intersectionality. This is the idea that the fates of pe vulnerable, pe vulnerable people, their fates are intertwined. What happens to one marginal group is rarely confined to that one group. Take, for example, preemptive policing. That is, assuming that someone is guilty of something prior to evidence. Assuming that somebody's guilty by virtue of who their relatives are, what they look like, assuming that they're criminals. Well, that idea got popularized in the USA Patriot Act. But really, this was, this was an idea that was used against Muslims for the last 13 years, but it began much earlier. It, for African Americans, it's been there for a long time. Slavery, Jim Crow, lynchings, surveillance, after all, that's what surveillance is. It's preemptive policing. It's assuming guilt before ever having any reason to. And it, it spread. It spread to Muslims. It spread to undocumented migrants with SB 1070, with S secure communities, and many other racial profiling laws. I mean, that's what preemptive policing is, right? Racial profiling is when you assume that somebody's guilty of something because of what they look like and who they hang out with. And sure enough, we saw, again, a version of preemptive policing with a renewed attention to police brutality. 
We saw it in the deaths of Michael Brown and Eric Garmer and Kajit Gardner and Kajima Powell and Miriam Perry, and it became normalized. But that war, the war against one group was rarely just a war against that one group. So how do we deal with it? Well, let me suggest that the devil, or evil with a D, see how I did that? Devil is in the details. If it's not located in persons, it's located in logics, in rules, in ways of doing things. So, when Michael Brown's death occurred, everybody had a lot to say, including the New York Times. New York Times pointed out that there's something called reasonable fear, that the cops sometimes have a reasonable fear, they have a reasonable standard that prompts them to shoot. They were trying to be critical. But the question here was, reasonable for whom? For whom is it reasonable to shoot somebody because they're walking down the street? For whom is it reasonable? Some sense the question of reasonable fear is predicated on a universal standard by which police are trained. So in some sense here, the question is not who, but what. What kind of training do the police get that allows police brutality to be seen as standard police practice? But that's not glamorous. That's not what's up in the 7 o'clock news or CNN or MSNBC. But that's really where we should be looking in the practices, and what kind of assumptions do those practices have? Where do the police stand? Do they work in their communities? Do they work with their communities? Or do they, are they trained to see everyone around them as evil, except for their own? And that's, I think, where we have to look. The next idea is this, the, the, the prevailing logic of the US government, at least over the last 14 years, which is that national security Keeping our country safe is about making a more efficient law enforcement system, right? Do away with evidence, do away with questions, do away with efficiency. But I'm here to say, and I think a lot of you know this better than I do, that efficiency is necessarily anti-democratic. That is the point. Efficiency means that we don't, the police don't have to stop, look at themselves, question themselves wonder what their practices are about. The reason behind overwhelming national security, laws that want to get rid of warrants and evidence, that resort to DNA and surveillance, is the belief that security demands acting fast and quickly. But in fact, the whole point of obstacles, procedures, double-checking evidence is to slow people down. It's a demand to have evidence. It's a demand for accountability. And that's what the torture program, the USA Patriot Act, the fusion centers, the FBI bases don't do, databases don't do. They don't force an accounting. They don't force accountability. And they don't require us to think about the logic by which law enforcement and politicians stop and detain people. And I guess that's the challenge that you all are in some sense confronting, whether you're doing national security or housing or education or other things. You're actually forcing people, but forcing the state, forcing the police to re-examine their practices. And I think that's, that's where politics is happening. It's not happening in Congress with its overwhelming zeal for more and more efficiency, for more and more national security. But the people who didn't vote in November 2014, they may not be lefties. They may not be activists. They may not be revolutionaries, but they know something's wrong. That's why they didn't vote. They're not necessarily the ones marching in the street to the logic of Black Lives Matter, but they know something's wrong. So the real question for 2015 is not how we make change, because you're making it, but how do we convince the unconverted to join us to make change? And I think the answer to that, in part, is to show them the details to show them that the evil, the devil, it's not black people, it's not minorities, it's not the vulnerable, it's not the poor. It's in the very unglamorous, unexamined, unaccounted, quotidian, minute details. And that may be the way to make change. For me, the inspiration, it's been a pretty dark year 2014. The inspiration for me was my students. I teach a pretty bizarre course, so I'm lucky enough to be at a school that lets me do that. <laughs> called Intro Political Philosophy. And I teach all the conventional thinkers. But especially I start with John Locke, who writes about the basis of social contracts, which a lot of us tend to think is in 
the U.S. Constitution. And I walk these students who have great politics, but they don't know why they have them. Some of them are really kind of uh, conservative. They're not quite sure why they're doing what they're doing. And at the end of this 14 pretty rigorous week semester, what gave me hope was that they could see it. They could see the devil in the details. They could see that evil wasn't about people. It was about the details that are unexamined. And that's where all of you come in. You're the ones paying attention to that. Thank you for your inspiration. Especially like being conscious of the space that we are in right now, um, 
it is very important to remember like there's a predominantly white space right now and like what allyship means. Allyship does not mean shaming the way we are we are acting in our own streets. It does not mean shaming the tactics we use to reclaim our land or our rights. It does not mean shaming property destruction or the way we express our rage against the genocide of our people. Um, it means <laughs> I know that makes all of y'all uncomfortable. I know that, but yo, know, this is our brothers and sisters that we're gonna kill. So expect to be angry. expect us to be angry. Um, so I think that like we're just really appreciative of the community. Word. Thank you. So um, the, these demands that Vanessa just wrote and um, a description of what we have come up together that I'm about to read you, um, it's really important to recognize it doesn't come from college institutions. This does not come from academics or people with PhDs. This comes from our brothers and sisters in the streets every day. So, um, about the hashtag Black Lives Matter, it, it within itself arose out of a place of grief and sorrow and as a declaration for all black lives, all black people. We weren't seeking sympathy or approval from white people. I'm gonna say that again. We weren't seeking sympathy or approval from white people. We wanted ourselves to look at each other as a whole community and say, we matter. And it wasn't only the killings, it was also the constant harassment and terror. It was the levels of unemployment and homelessness, shout out to Springfield, no one leaves, and that all the people on this planet, we are incarcerated at the highest rate. We said there's a war on black and brown bodies and enough is enough. We are here to declare our humanity because although we were brought here only in ser to, serve, to work in service of others, and although we were never meant to survive, the fact is that we did. The hashtag Black Lives Matter is about black pride and black power and standing up against the world that tries to annihilate. I do not say it. I ain't going to college. Annihilate us. Annihilate us. There we go. <laughs> stands out to Black Lives Matter real heavy. Um, and he stated that we don't hate white people. We hate the system of white supremacy that gives them uh, asymmetrical power and privilege. That we don't hate cops. We hate, the, we hate the pattern of police brutality that systematically harasses and kills black people and other people of color with impunity. We don't hate soldiers. We hate the honor of war that terrorizes the most political and economical vulnerable amongst us. And we don't hate rich people. We hate the system of capitalism that creates an elite 1% at the expense of the rest of us. So it is preciously because of my love for humanity that I get enraged at systems that prevent people from flourishing and being free. It's frustrating to see my righteous anger at unjust system interpreted as hatred for individuals. But it's more frustrating to see the oppressed suffer while their majestic and injustice remain silent. And we won't be silent because silence is violence. Um, I want to first say it's a really great honor to follow these young people. And I hope what I say it's a great honor to follow these young people. And I hope what I say will be worthy of them. So I'm Sarah Lennox, and I'm speaking on behalf of the David Ruggles Center for Early Florence History and Underground Railroad Studies. I'd like to begin by reading the mission statement of the David Ruggles Center. We attempt to fight racism by honoring and documenting the lives of the egalitarian trailblazers that came before us. Specifically, the David Ruggles Center is committed to remembering and preserving the work of the unique abolitionist community of Florence, Massachusetts, our very own Florence, from 1840 to 1863, and its involvement in the Underground Railroad, particularly remembering the large community of free and formerly enslaved black people lived in Florence during that period, over 10% of the population of Florence, and also the work of the radical abolitionists 
committed to equality among black people and white people, among women and men, among all workers, who in the 1840s established a utopian community in Florence called the Northampton Association of Education and Industry. David Ruggles, a leading African-American abolitionist who assisted over 600 slaves, including Frederick Douglass, to achieve their freedom, was a member of that group, and it's in his house, which is still preserved, still standing in Florence, at 225 Nanka Street, where the David Ruggles Center is located. Concretely, the David Ruggles Center focuses on organizing programs and conducting walking tours along the African American Heritage Trail of Florence. Uh, Ruggles Center events that are coming up include a presentation by Bruce Laurie, a professor emeritus from the History Department at UMass, on his new book, Rebels in Paradise. You know, Northampton is called the Paradise of America. So. Uh, sketches of Northampton abolitionists, which profiles five rebellious figures, including Ruggles, who launched Northampton's abolitionist movement, and the book links the anti-slavery movement in Western Massachusetts to broader developments in economics, civic, civil life, and political affairs. Bruce is going to be speaking this Thursday at 7 o'clock in Smith's Nielsen Library. On Martin Luther King Day, um, there's a walking tour of Florence um, that the AFSC is sponsoring. Um, and on February 12th, there's a uh, book reading um, about uh, African American poetry of the 19th century. So why is this important? Why is this of more than antiquarian interest? Um, the historian of the Northampton Association of Education and Industry begins his book by saying that it's about people who step outside society in an effort to change it by constructing a way of life that could serve as a model for the future. These figures can serve as a model for us as we too try to build a way of life and a society that can serve as an alternative model for the present and the future. Very specifically, remembering and being inspired by these 19th century visionaries who show us that Northampton has a history of its very own, of courageous people who are willing to risk everything to challenge racism and to envision and fight for a way of living in which both black people and white people would no longer be subject to and be formed by the larger structures of a racist, of a, of a racist society. And that is a history to which we can appeal to inform our own struggles as we work for justice now. So I'd like to say these figures, these abolitionists, give us hope. The gospel choir who sang, it doesn't matter if you kill us, it doesn't matter if you jail us, we are kept alive by hope, gives me hope, and especially the young people whom we just heard, who told us what they believe in, um, what it means to stand up, and who are forging perhaps the most important movement of our time, they give me very great hope. Thank you. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Um, this is Tigre, and I'm Shen. We're from Mass Slavery Apology. In the last few months, there has been growing public recognition of how deep and devastating the racism is in this country. Mass Slavery Apology is a grassroots group based in Franklin County, Massachusetts, that works to build awareness and activism around our country's enduring racism. Our members are ordinary people who believe that the damage caused by racism must be repaired before society can be whole. We share a vision of a multiracial, multicultural, multilingual, multi-faith global community that strives for just and respectful treatment for all. We hope to deepen our own and our community's understanding of racism and racial justice. I want to tell you about some of our projects. There's information about them back on the literature table at the back of the room. In this booklet, Facing Our Unhealed Past, we describe the legacy of slavery and make commitments to restorative action 
including reparations for slavery. If our words resonate with you, we invite you to add your name to the list of almost 400 signatures we've received to date. We offer free programs in Greenfield once a month. The next one's this Saturday um, on Race and Class. It's led by Angela Burkfield from Southern Vermont, and we hope you can join us. We also organize a monthly peer-led discussion group in Greenfield, open to all who want to discuss the racism they find in themselves and in everyday life. We share information and resources through our occasional email newsletters. We have a website and a Facebook page. And we collaborate with other groups, both locally and nationally, to build the movement for racial justice. We hope you can join us in this important work. You can sign up to join our email list. You can add your name to our apology statement. You can come to our events or other events in your own community. Most important, you can support the liberation struggles of oppressed groups. You can support Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter, the struggles of indigenous people, of Latino and Muslims in this country, in our communities. You can become an active part of the movement to undo racism. Thanks. Friends from Jewish Voices for Peace, Students for Justice in Palestine, and the Western Mass Coalition for Justice. Hi everyone, so we're on a, a pretty short time scale, so I want to start by saying that both Jewish Voice for Peace and the Western Mass uh, Committee for Palestine has um, information in the back that has our, our meeting times and contact information, so if we don't get through everything we want to get through but you're interested, please pick up some literature at the back and you can learn more. Um, I am speaking on behalf of Jewish Voice for Peace. Uh, Jewish Voice for Peace members are inspired by Jewish tradition to work together for peace, social justice, equality, human rights, respect for international law, and US policies that reflect those values. JVP opposes anti-Jewish, anti-Muslim, and anti-Arab bigotry and oppression. JVP seeks an end to the Israeli occupation of the West Bank, Gaza, and East Jerusalem, and peace and self-determination. We seek peace and self-determination for Israelis, Palestinians, and all peoples of the Middle East. Because we see the Israeli occupation of Palestine as part of a larger system of settler colonialism and racism that plays out um, right here, this is the intersectionality um, that we heard of earlier, uh, Western Mass Jewish Voice for Peace is committed to standing up for racial justice and liberation in our own communities. We want to be explicit that we stand with Black Lives Matter, the Black Lives Matter movement here in our region, the people that we heard from earlier, and uh, we look forward to working with them, to being led by them, um, and that in our hearts, that work is deeply connected with our work for Palestinians. Woo! Woo! So similarly the, similarly, the Western Mass Coalition for Palestine is a Palestine solidarity organization that operates within an anti-racist framework to reject the colonization and ethnic cleansing of Palestine. So we're a group of workers, of students, of community, community members in the area that serve to amplify, amplify the voices of Palestinians which are systematically marginalized in the United States. So hopefully you've heard about some of our teach-ins and uh, education and outreach events here. Um, and as a solidarity organization, we take our directive from Palestinian civil society as represented by the call for BDS, the, the call for boycott, divestment, and sanctions. Um, where Palestinians called on all people of conscience throughout the world, that's everybody in this room, to boycott, divestment, divest, and impose sanctions on the state of Israel until it complies with international law and human rights. So we help facilitate work around BDS. Similarly, JVP also supports um, BDS both nationally, the National Organization of Jewish Voice for Peace has specific campaigns, and we also work together um, locally on um, other BDS uh, campaigns that will be happening in the future. Um, related to that, we have a political working group. We've already met with Jim McGovern. We've, worked, we've met with um, um, Elizabeth Warren's people, and um, both around issues of BDS and also generally uh, defunding um, or uh, checking the U.S. support for the Israeli military. Um, 
And another synergy with that, with the Coalition for Palestine, would be a resolution that we crafted for our city, city councilors to impose an arms embargo against Israel, again, until it complies with human rights and international law. Um, and that's something, that's a quick thing you can do to sign in the back corner with Jennifer and Sean um, to participate in that arms embargo resolution. Just, just very briefly, we also have a ritual working group, which you can read about more, where we're trying to uh, create uh, Jewish rituals, also inspired by social justice for everybody, um, that uh, will be happening around the valley. There's also um, a book club, and also we hope to see all of you out at the Black Lives Matter 413 events in the future. Out Now is a youth-led, adult-advised, queer youth organization in Springfield that works to promote harm reduction, self-determination, and community building through anti-oppression organizing. Check out their website at outnowyouth.org for more information. We're ready to fight. We're, We're ready, ready to fight. We're ready to win. We're ready to win. We must love each other and respect each other. We, we must, must love, love each other and respect each other. We have nothing to lose but our chains. We have nothing to lose but our chains. We're ready to fight. We're ready to fight. We're ready to win. We're ready to win. We must love each other and respect each other. We must love each other and respect each other. We have nothing to lose but our chains. We have nothing to lose but our chains. We're ready to fight. We're ready to fight. We're ready to win. We must love each other and respect each other. We must love each other. We have nothing to lose but our chains! Stupid dyke bitch. Come join us. Out Now is working for an end to state violence and the criminalization of our communities. Out Now is working for the elimination of the political repression. Out Now is working for self-determination for all oppressed people. Out Now is working for the abolition of racist policies. Out Now is working for an end to capitalist exploitation. <coughs> and Out Now is working for an end to all oppressions.
political arm of Out Now, um, and so we do interactive theater called Theater Via Press, where we basically practice for our lives in ways that we can sort of disrupt um, oppression and work against it. So um, we travel around to community organizations and schools and really anywhere that we're asked. So if you're interested in having us come and do a little gig with you guys, hit us up or check out our website. Good evening, my name is Donald Perry. I'm the lead organizer for Operation Change. Operation Change is <coughs> a, a project of a rise for social justice. The, the purpose of this project is to change the antiquated policies and abusive practices of the, of the Massachusetts parole system. Yeah. And so what is parole? Parole is part of the rehabilitation process. Regardless of whether a person is sentenced to six months, six years, or six years, after serving two-thirds of their sentence, this person is, should be paroled back into the community as part of the rehabilitation and reintegration process to allow that individual to more successfully uh, reestablish themselves back into their communities. But as of 2000, the, bar, the Boston Bar Association realized there was a, a really a, a terrible decline and parole in the state of Massachusetts. So they formulated a task force. The task force uh, did research for two years and realized that not only was there a decline in parole or reintegration in Massachusetts, but it also was creating a major public safety, the issue of major public safety, and it was costing us millions of dollars that the Commonwealth could not afford. So the task force made five re recommendations to the government and the Massachusetts parole system. None of those five recommendations were implemented. A decade later, uh, uh, several attorneys, Patty Garen, Leslie Walker, and a few others, they did another two years research about the state of the Massachusetts parole system. And still, none of those <coughs> changes have been implemented. So, Operation Change purpose is to initiate a statewide campaign to raise awareness about <clears throat> what the issues of, Massachusetts, of the Massachusetts parole system is, and to create enough momentum across the state where we can have our local officials to also make sure that the Massachusetts parole system does what it was supposed to do, to give people a chance. I mean, everybody makes mistakes, and re re redemption is a part of what we're supposed to do. And in that, not only, well, in all abusive re relationships, what is it? Abusive relationships are based on shame, isolation, and abuse. The Massachusetts parole system does what it wants. It doesn't have to answer anyone. So one of our primary goals is for transparency, have checks and balances, and make them accountable. But then most importantly is to help dispel a lot of the shame and a lot of isolation. So you'll be hearing more about me through our rise from social justice. But so thank you very much for having me. Hi, my name is Vera Duanina Cage, and I'm a recent addition to the American Civil Liberties Union of Massachusetts um, since April. And I just wanted to uh, capture some of the work that we're doing here out in Western Mass. Um, but for the most part, I want to make sure I acknowledge um, how we arrived to a position in Springfield, and it was because of the foundation that groups like Arise for Social Justice that you'll hear from, groups like Out Now, um, that you heard from already earlier, um, and the the real collaboration that, that has, has been taking place in Springfield, in our communities, um, really bridging the gap of the Upper Valley with the Lower Valley, um, and recalling way before the ACLU, um, the Justice for Charles Wilhite campaign where um, people showed, you know, their, it's movement building when you actually move, move away from your comfort zone, move away from your community to, to work and organize with other people. Um, so when folks saw the organizing that was happening in Springfield around the unjust wrongful conviction of Charles Wilhite, um, people came out to do the solidarity work that Arise and Out Now were doing um, in the courthouses in, in Springfield. And so now, um, with, with that premise, the ACLU um, 
published a report in 2012 uh, looking at, you know, incarceration, looking at mass incarceration, looking at imprisonment and the criminal justice system. And one of the things that um, they looked at were three major um, school districts in Massachusetts, Boston, Springfield, and Worcester. And Springfield had the highest rates of arrest because we have, in Springfield, police officers called the Quebec Union stationed in the elementary, middle schools, and high schools in Springfield. So for um, not following the orders of a teacher, bouncing a basketball in the hallway, um, people are getting arrested, um, taken out of school, handcuffed, and have to do a juvenile, um, be part of the juvenile uh, justice system. And so my work now has expanded. Um, the ACLU fortunately has been able to expand my work. So um, we're looking and being in communities where we, where people are calling out for help in Agawam, in Ludlow, in Amherst, in Holyoke, particularly Holyoke, um, want to focus attention on Holyoke, and also um, the collaborative work that we need to do with organizations that Barbara Madaloni's organ, you know, MTA, because teachers need to be at the table. And so I'm really hoping that we can do this work. Um, this is a small valley, and I'm really grateful to know each and every one of you um, that, that I know here, and hope to get to know y'all better, and um, connect with residents like Viviana De Jesus, who's in the audience here, who's a mom, who's a parent, um, that we need to encourage, you know, voices that are underrepresented to run for office, to run for positions, to do the job of what we have to do. Um, I'll be speaking about health care. Um, I think most of you uh, who are here have heard the term single-payer health care. And those of you who haven't, uh, it's about affordable, quality health care for everybody. Um, and uh, the... Uh, comments that I'm going to make today um, about three things. One, um, I want to tell you about an online petition that you can sign uh, for physicians for our national health program. I want to talk uh, just briefly about what's going on in Vermont and then say a couple of words about how you can get involved in the effort for single-payer health care right here in Massachusetts. So first, about um, Physicians for National, National Health Program. Uh, there are thousands of physicians all across the nation who want to see a quality, affordable, single-payer health care plan in the United States like most of Western industrialized nations have. And um, they have a petition online. You can go to www.pnhp.org and see that petition. You do not have to be a physician to sign on, and they're hoping to collect thousands and thousands of signatures to make it clear to legislators across the nation that we do want single-payer health care for all Americans. Um, thank you. In Vermont, Vermont, our sister state to the north, actually passed in 2011 um, a uh, legislation to move us to their state to the single-payer health care. And it's gotten stalled. Governor Peter Shumlin crashed. He did not produce the financing plan. Uh, this coming Thursday, on April uh, January 6th, there's going to be a rally at Montpelier. And if you feel motivated and want to help Vermont to get uh, raise your voice and help the people of Vermont, either give a call to your friends and family members up there and say, please join in the rally on Montpelier on Thursday, or get, uh, go up there. You can go to the Vermont Workers Center, the, the website, Vermont Workers Center. You'll find information about that. January Let me 8th. say now briefly about Massachusetts. Three important things to do about Massachusetts. We're going to file a Massachusetts single-payer health care again uh, this year. Please call your legislator, call your representative, call your senator. Tell them we want single-payer health care for Massachusetts. We know the legislators out here generally sign on to co-sponsored, but we absolutely need you to call and let them know about it. And the last thing is that Senator Jamie Eldridge, who is the co-sponsor, who is the lead sponsor of that bill, is interested in having hearings across the state to show the legislators, to show the voice of the people. And I just want to put that out there for you to hear about, because when you hear information from us about that, please come out. Please don't sit at home and say somebody else is going to show up. We need everybody to show up. If by any chance you don't know about single care health care or you haven't gotten involved in MassCare, which is the organization, I'd be delighted to speak with you after the event or my colleague out there, Alice Swift, raise your hand. Alice or I would be glad to talk with you and we'd love to sign you up. Thank you so very much. Mother Joan, that was 50 years ago. The nurses sent me. I'm a labor organizer. 
Yes, after I lost my family, they died. Yellow fever took them all. My building burned down. And I no longer had a business, so I had to do God's work and go out and organize. The workers. And I started with the mine workers. The nurses sent me. The National Nurses Union, the Mass Nurses Association. Right now, that's a union who organizes around here, along with many other unions. Unions aren't just about being on strike. That's what a lot of you think because you're not union members. You're not union members because unions have been squashed by the Republican Party over the past three decades by pulling all of the teeth out of the National Labor Relations Board. Mother Jones didn't even know what that was because they didn't need a National Labor Relations Board. The National Labor Relations Board now has hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of cases before them and they are impotent in their ability to resolve them. So what are we doing? The nurses are working on social justice issues. We know that workers out there are having trouble organizing and we know that people aren't working an eight hour day anymore. We know we don't have childcare, we don't have health insurance. We don't have overtime. We don't have a living wage. The nurses are now able to help others by moving social justice issues. We were on the front lines of Haiti when the earthquake ruined that country. We have the National RN Network that also went to and many other places who were in crisis. Ebola has brought a huge crisis into our world and we have been sending nurses to Africa to work with the dying and to prevent Ebola from moving across the continent. We also have been working on the Robin Hood tax. Robin Hood's one of our heroes, you know. Robin Hood, the Robin Hood tax is a financial transition, trans, transaction tax that we've been working on for years. It's now moving again, hopefully, before Congress in the next uh, few weeks. And it's a tax on Wall Street. I see my stop sign there, too. It's a tax on Wall Street so that we can finally fund the needs, the unmet needs of the poor, of workers, of seniors, fund education, and pull people out of poverty. Unions aren't just about strikes <laughs> and wages, but about social justice. So let's agitate. Hi, I'm Rose, this is Hector and Heather, and we are the Pioneer Valley Worker Center. We seek to build power for low-wage and immigrant workers in Western Massachusetts through innovative, worker-driven organizing strategies, education, research, direct services, and community collaborations. The PBWC empowers wage and immigrant workers to engage in strategies to combat workplace abuse and improve working conditions throughout our community. The center builds coalitions and partnerships with unions, community groups, cooperatives, and individuals to draw attention to the common struggles of people across Western Mass. And we took the Raging Grannies up on their ask to do something creative, so I'm going to move to that now. Hello. Welcome to the Sustainable Restaurant. My name is Beth, and this is our grand opening. I'm the owner, and I wanted to take the time to introduce myself. How are you doing tonight? I'm good. Uh, it's, it's really good to be here. Um, you know, I'm a cook myself, so I'm excited to take a look at your menu. Yes, and I'm a waitress, so I'm really excited about this new uh, sustainable restaurant that's open. I'd like to take your order. Great. Uh, looking at the menu here, I see that you have fair wages. Wow. <laughs> um, can you tell me more about that? Oh, yes. Um, well, we, it's three dollars an hour for wait staff, and it actually just went up thirty-seven cents in two thousand and fifteen, and that's after forty years. Um, would you like an order of that? Oh, um, that seems a little light for me. Can I get something on it? Maybe a side of benefits to go with that? <laughs> Ooh, um, we just ran out of benefits. Um, we only had enough for management. But we do have a lot of extra hours, and actually today's special is the double shift. <laughs> mm. Now, does that count with overtime? Overtime? I'll have to check on that. 
Most restaurants really don't serve overtime. It's just really too expensive. Um, it says that all of these dishes are served with sexual harassment, discrimination. <laughs> <laughs> Um, can I substitute respect and dignity in the workplace for you guys? <laughs> we actually have a strict rule about no substitutions. <laughs> but we do ensure that all of our meat that we serve is humanely treated and that our vegetables are organic. Does that do it for you? Here at the, at the Pioneer Valley Worker Center, we're striving for a community where workers benefit from the fruits of their labor and build towards an economy where no one is working for. Our organizing seeks organizing seeks to to expand our local communities' share understanding of sustainable, a sustainable food system to include improve wages, working conditions, and agreements across procedures for all workers in the food chain. And so we're here to assist workers in development work grassroots campaigns, providing legal assistance, coordinating trainings and translation services, organizing community buildings and events, and bringing workers together to advocate for local, state, and national policies. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm Al Williams, and I'm the director of Northampton Community Television here in Northampton. Yay! Um, yay! Um, so I'm here to talk about NCTV and also alternative media in general. Um, there are a lot of great messages in this room uh, here today, a lot of compassionate messages, important messages. And the work that we do at Northampton Community Television um, and in alternative media is to try to help everyone here uh, be empowered, have those voices be empowered. Um, so what we are, we like to envision ourselves as a legal graffiti wall or street art wall or a place of expression and empowerment for the community. Um, what does that mean? That means that we provide um, resources of a number of different kinds to um, all groups and individuals inside of the Northampton community and beyond. Um, our own sort of uh, vision of the community extends beyond the geographic barriers of the city of Northampton. Um, we provide uh, equipment that can be uh, cameras and lighting and audio equipment, um, education and editing and access to editing facilities. Um, we provide physical space for community groups that want to meet. So if you have a community group and it will fit inside of our space, um, our space is the property of the community in our um, vision. And so if you're looking for a meeting space, that's something you can, you can contact us about as well. Um, we have staff to help guide you in framing your message. Because one thing that we realize is your content is extremely important, but the manner in which you frame and deliver your content um, Whatever it is um, that you are expressing is also of vital importance. Um, we serve a role that is opposed to corporate media in the United States, which is essentially owned by five or six uh, large corporations um, that essentially are crafting message that almost the entire country hears. And so um, we invite you to engage with us and to come by our facility, stop by and see us, um, talk to us about what kind of needs you have, and help us respond to those in, in, in proper ways. There are a couple of different programs that might be of particular interest to you, including the fact that we do free public service announcements for community groups. So if you want a small video piece that um, is a very, very high quality, high professional quality, come and see us and you can utilize it to distribute your message on Facebook, to distribute it on Twitter, to distribute it on a YouTube channel, um, amongst your own constituency in whatever manner that you see fit. Um, we, we provide that service for free for all organizations. Um, we also, um, if you have a crowdfunding project that you are interested in, in starting, we provide free crowdfunding videos, um, helping people with uh, craft crowdfunding videos for their projects. We have a citizen journalism project called Paradise City Press at paradisecitypress.org that is news produced by community members. So you can tell your own stories, uh, your stories about the community, about your own work, about what is really happening on the ground for you. Um, through that service. That has nothing to do with television. It's online content that is print, that is audio, that is video, that is still photography. Um, we, we don't conceive of ourselves as a TV station, but we are a multimedia service for everyone in, in this community and beyond. Um, and just as a, as, a, as a source of information for, for other communities that have these services, Greenfield Community Television has a center, East Hampton has a center, Amherst has a center, 
Athol Orange has a center. Um, I am myself a resident of Polio, where uh, we recently signed one of the best, largest contracts in Western New England to, for the first time in 20 years, bring community media to the city of Polio. Um, I'm really excited about that. Um, Springfield has a center that's coming online. These are communities that have had no voice or access to voice. And the internet is a fantastic, fantastic, it's really most people find us on the internet, but we are not, we're not here to produce television, we're here to teach and provide resources for content or whatever your message is. So please visit us at NorthamptonTV.org, um, find me and ask me questions, contact us with any questions you have. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, <clears throat> I don't know how many of you got to go to the uh, 50th anniversary march on Washington, but um, this very moving speech was given by Al Sharpton, kind of the keynote. And he spoke about voter suppression and the laws that have been passed recently to uh, make it difficult for people to register and vote. And he suggested we walk into the uh, polling stations <clears throat> where those laws have been passed and the states where those laws were passed. And when they asked us for a photo ID, pull out the pictures of the people who were martyred in the struggle for justice in this country. Uh, I found that a very moving speech. And uh, it took me a while, but I, I think I've got a song about it. <coughs> don't tell me you don't know me. I voted here before. Since Truman snuck past Dewey, I've been walking through that door. And now you say I need ID. Well, I've got one to show. I've carried it for 50 years, three faces in a row. The first is Andrew Goodman, James Cheney to his right. The third is Michael Schwerner, and they brought me here tonight. They gave their lives so I could vote. They were murdered by the Klan. Look at these pictures, then you'll know exactly who I am. Back then, it was a poll tax and the old grandfather clause. But now you're getting cagey with your voter ID laws. You talk about election fraud. Let's talk about Jim Crow. Don't talk to me, you talk to these three faces in a row. You tell of law and order, why don't you tell the truth? There's nothing that you wouldn't do to keep me from that booth. Your law degree may hinder me, but this one thing I know, I'm not alone, my right to vote paid for long ago, and the price was high, the lives of these three faces in a row. We get to hear Charlie again at the end, in case you didn't know that. Thank you. <laughs> Arise for social justice. Um, here to talk about housing and homelessness in Springfield, Twelfth, each and every one of our communities. Um, before I talk about our dreams, let's talk about our nightmares that we're encountering every day with homelessness. We have people sleeping in bus stations, doorways, bus stops, police stations, emergency rooms, which is not good. A nightmare is when we have a family, but we walk into the office at 9 o'clock in the morning and there's two different, two or three different families there with four or five kids each, and we're working with them all day throughout the day and trying to help them get into an emergency shelter and come three or four o'clock in the afternoon and they're still there and we have a place for them to go. That's a nightmare. Work for another two or three hours and come five o'clock we still have no place to go. You all know we run off the grants and donations, so at times we don't have money at a rise on here and we can put them in a hotel. Sometimes we get lucky because of you guys donate money to us and we take that money that we have on hand and we put them in a hotel, but only to find out the next day they're back at a rise with the same problem and we still don't have a solution because 
The welfare system is never denying them shelter or proper adequate housing. Uh, the dream we have is to have proper, safe housing and proper and safe shelters for homeless people to go. Proper housing, proper and affordable housing, which is what we consider 30% of our income for these um, women and families to be able to afford to pay a decent wage for rent and a safe place to live and still have enough money to survive on which is that's a problem. Most of us are paying more than 50% of our income to live. Another dream that we're trying to get, um, we're hoping for, is to create a community land trust where the community itself has control over where they live, how they live, and can pay a livable housing for their own, a livable income for their housing. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. I'm sorry. Good evening, everyone. I'm Justin David. I'm the rabbi at Congregation B'nai Israel, and I have the honor of representing our interfaith community. And I just want to say something very simple, which is that we embrace collectively every issue that's being brought up tonight. And I want to say just very simply and very clearly and explicitly, we are here for you. Uh, we want to be engaged with all the issues that are here tonight and the issues that aren't being represented here tonight for two reasons. One, it's part of our mission as sacred communities to bring some healing to this world. And you are on the front lines of that. And we need you to help us fulfill our mission. But there's another reason, which is that we can provide something that goes beyond what each of our groups does individually. We provide communities that have been existing for a long time, that are, that are, that are diverse in every way. And so we provide a network of relationships. Uh, one thing I want to say here, because this is a sacred space, not only because of this beautiful building and, and the stellar leadership that's here, but because of the passion and the love that's been brought into this room through each and every person who's come up here tonight and what you represent. I'm very well aware that once we leave these doors, we feel the weight of the world on our shoulders, and that weight can be crushing. And so I want to, since I'm a rabbi, I want to leave you with a little bit of reassurance to feel that love, to hold it close, and to be in touch with each other so we can remind each other of the holiness of the work that we do. Thank you. The Massachusetts Teachers Association. We were here for the PDA meeting. And uh, so here we are, celebrating it again. Thanks, Barbara Madaloni, president of the Massachusetts Teachers Association. Thank you, Paki. Uh, good evening, and I know it's late, uh, so I'm gonna uh, keep my words. I'll try to be as brief as possible. Um, it's, it's really good to be home, and uh, it's really powerful to have been able to sit through and, and hear all the work, uh, the, the details, the beautiful details that you've all been working on. Uh, so it's, I, I, I was thinking though about sort of the context that we're in, um, and it's a very particular context right now, although it's a familiar one. Uh, where a, a notion of hyper-capitalism and individualism, uh, efficiency models, as we heard about, dehumanization based on those efficiency models, sort of technocratic worldviews, are really in, in so many spaces uh, and, and have pushed in and privatized our public spaces. So I, I want to really honor that this is a space that's pushed back against that and is a deeply human space and a joyful place and a place of, of meaningful anger. In schools these days, what we're seeing is that the context that I just described of dehumanization and racism and, and a technocratic data-driven worldview is occupying our schools. It's particularly occupying our schools with black and brown children. Uh, Vera spoke to the policing that's happening in our schools. That's an outcome, it's an outgrowth of this narrow view of what it means to be in school, of this really focusing on, on developing consumers and workers and not developing human beings who are going to engage the world with creativity and hope and a deep faith in other human beings and in themselves and in our possibilities. So that's where we are and what are we going to do about it? Um, well, you're already doing it, so I kind of feel like congratulations and thanks, and I'm really happy and I'm glad we're all doing this together. Uh, in the MTA, what we are doing is we're going to start a campaign 
of the schools our children deserve. And what I think we really need to do is, is change the conversation about what education is for and what it can look like and why it's public education. Yes. And, and that, we have to really start to get through the public Others have said it's a sacred space, the public space, and that place has been corrupted and is being privatized through the testing, through the assaults on teachers and our unions, through the charter schools. But let's reclaim that public space, and then let's reimagine, because the work that we've seen tonight, especially from the young people that have been here, that's the work that our public schools sh should be helping to create. Those are the young people that we want to see who are deeply engaged and asking questions and using all kinds of mediums to express themselves and to engage their community in democracy. So we're going to begin that campaign in the MTA, and I'm going to ask you to be a part of that. And you can be a part of it formally by holding a community forum where we raise questions about what is the purpose of public education and what should it look like that every child deserves. Um, but you can do it informally. You can, you can really, it matters when someone talks about testing to say, what are you talking about? Have you lost your mind? <laughs> testing has nothing to do with democracy and young people. Growing. Like, it's really that simple. I think we're at a place right now where the world's ready to shift. When somebody talks about test scores, you can say, isn't it true that test scores are really just a measure of socioeconomic status of the family that the child grew up in? I'm not sure why you're making that irrelevant. Like, let's speak truth to power in that way, but then let's also speak truth to power for what do we want for our children? What do we want the, their days to look like and how can we get there? What are the resources that we need to do that? And we need a lot of resources. And that's why we need to work on looking at our tax system, we need to look at economic injustice, we need to look at racial injustice, and that has to be all a part of our movement together when we're looking at public education. My simple ask for you right now, before we go, is that this Saturday at Northampton High School, the Foundation Budget Review Commission, which I sit on, but I'm not gonna be able to be there, is holding a hearing looking at what are the resources that we need for our public schools and how do we distribute those resources. I'm gonna ask you to go and speak, and speak in a broad way. Don't let the committee narrow the focus. Speak about what we want, what we need, and what every child deserves. And then, and then it's our job, to, and it's the people in the state house job to figure out how we can get those resources. It's not ours to say, oh, it's an austerity time, so we can't do it. So go and, and envision something very possible. And thank you all very much for your work. I passionately believe that it's the passion in rooms like this that will change so many things that need to be changed. But we're also in a system where what happens in our capitals, whether it's at the state level or the federal level, actually is important. What we do at National Priorities Project is we look at the federal budget and look at the very important ways in which those federal budget decisions affect all of us in this room, just about every issue we talked about tonight. Uh, and so for us, we have this sort of passion-focused um, data analytical hodgepodge going on that really believes that we can move to a better place. And I, the, the grannies earlier were talking about, you know, no more war. Um, we've got some very strong ideas about shifting money out of the military budget and some of the really transformational things that can result from that. You should have got a handout earlier tonight, um, eight slides on two sides of the page. Really quickly, you know, your basic federal budget eye. For every dollar that our elected officials um, have the discretion to decide how to spend, 55 cents of that is going to military purposes. Think about that. Meanwhile, they will tell you that the children are our future and all these great things, and yet education, let's see, what does it say here? Um, six cents on the dollar for education. So I thought, well, what would be a good like, hypothetical? And so what I did was I, I took this first pie chart and I kind of played around with it a little bit. And I said, what would happen if we increased the budget for every one of those things except just basic government? So education, science, energy and assistance. What if we increased each of those by 50% and 
and took that money out of the military budget. And at the end of the day, you're spending over $200 billion less on the military, but it's still a big piece of pie, and it's still more than one-third, you know, it's 36 cents for every single dollar that we're paying in taxes. So even with that kind of pairing back, uh, we end up with a system that still has room for improvement. And moreover, we would still be hundreds of billions of dollars ahead of all of our you know, defense competitors, all of our you know, peer nations, etc. To give you a sense of the kind of the magnitude of dollars we're talking about here, the Earned Income Tax Credit is a huge program that is transformational for lower income working folks. This little sliver here is the Earned Income Tax Credit in the state of Massachusetts in 2011. And this big piece here, this tower, is military contracts in the state of Massachusetts in that same year. And we don't know that. I mean, even state budget advocates, I was one for eight years in Connecticut, they don't know that that's the sort of comparison we're looking at, and yet that's sort of the status quo. Um, you know, it, it, it's supposedly discretionary spending, but it's as though we have carved that out and said, this will continue in perpetuity, and that's not okay, and we're all saying that, and we appreciate everything that you guys can do to help us get that message through to folks. Um, really quickly, bringing this home here to uh, Northampton, just as an example, concrete example of shifting funds. Uh, in 2014, Northampton will pay $8.9 million for total war spending. $8.9 million. For that same amount of money here in Northampton, we could have full university scholarships for 450 students and solar panels for 250, 2,500 homes. So those would be really positive things that would not just make our planet better, our city better, uh, but invest in a future that is prosperous and is one that embodies the spirit of everything that's happened tonight. So I thank you for your attention. And for our I have experienced a do-nothing Congress for these last many years, but we have a can-do valley. Yeah. And a very caring community now. This has been wonderful to hear. I'm Susan Lance. I'm a member of the Nuclear, it used to be Nuclear Free Future Coalition of Western Massachusetts. But in the name of solidarity, recognizing what's happening, we have adopted a new name, which is the Nuclear and Carbon Free Future Coalition of Western Massachusetts. So we, we are very proud to have done that. Coming up immediately in regards to nuclear power is the UN conference the end of April uh, to review the NPT treaty, the non uh, the proliferation treaty. I can never get that out. This happens every five years, and now there's a big, huge international effort to really put teeth into this treaty and really to hold their feet to it, to do something to have the nuclear countries of this world stop, start really disarming those stockpiles. None of this, everything that was talked about tonight will make no difference if we are allowed, if we still allow in our world this, these very dangerous weapons. To that end, we are trying to uh, really educate the people, particularly the citizens in the United States, about this. And to that end, uh, Brianna Malloy and the American Defense Service Committee uh, is uh, drumming up a great interest and uh, people to go down to um, a weekend of events in New York City, the last weekend in April, Friday to Sunday, We'll have a whole education workshops of what's going on and all of that leading up to a People's March on Sunday. That's where you all can come in. Very important to let these people know that we're paying attention to this nuclear conference. So that's one thing that you can do. And to bring attention to that, we of the nuclear CFF committee uh, are working to have Elaine uh, Scari come to talk about her book, which the title is um, Thermonuclear Monarchy, Choosing Between Democracy or Doom. It, and again, to bring awareness to this nuclear situation. 
Okay, and we're doing one more thing, renewable power, uh, ready for renewables, which is we're having train the trainers now, and it really, it's a PowerPoint presentation, which we can all do and bring around to all communities. We thought that we could not end this evening without Frances Crow sharing her vision briefly with us. And uh, as she's coming up, we just want to let you know that I'm the face of the grannies here tonight, but it's really the raging grannies who organized all this with the incredible support of Jeff Napolitano, without whom none of this could have happened. And Todd Weir, the minister of this church, who uh, was also the, was the third point of our tripod. Francis Crow. Thank you, Kathy. And the raging grannies at AFSC to put this wonderful program together. Can't imagine anything better on this day of the new Congress. And I feel, you know, that we have to have a vision because without a vision, they say the people perish. And so I'm envisioning what I want Northampton to be, say, 10 years from now. Uh, I think that we've managed to stop the wars and we have divested ourselves from the federal government and we are the, not part of the United States of America, but we are part of the United Western Massachusetts. <laughs> so that our money will stay here. And we have used the money, first of all, to create a jobs program, to put everybody to work in Western Massachusetts, building a sustainable local society, repairing the, the sewers, the, uh, we have the, uh, the good light bulbs in, in all of the uh, buildings, and we have a, a set up uh, subsidies for all the local farmers that the subsidies are not going to the corporate growers who have, you know, all, the, all of the pesticides in the foods that is causing cancer among the workers and people who eat that food. And we have subsidies for the local grocery stores and not for the big corporate change, changes. <laughs> and for the local grocery stores like the Valley River Market and the Cereos and the State Street. And we have solar panels on all of the municipal buildings. And most of us will have read Naomi Klein's book, This Changes Everything. <laughs> Where she focuses on not shopping, but living the good life. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Charlie King. You'll sing us out. And, uh, and I hope you've been inspired and, uh, and all of our aspirations will move forward and we'll continue to create that world that we know we believe in and is a better a world and more just one than we live in today. So, uh, Why don't you sing yourselves out? Sing with me. It's real simple. La, 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 la. La, 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 la. La 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 That's all it is. I'm trying. La 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 We are the power of the river. We are the rain within the storm. 
are the force beneath the ocean. We are the undertow. La 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 we are the working people. We are the working people. We build up and we tear down. We build up and we tear down. We are the teachers and the students. We are the teachers and the students. The singers and the clowns. The la 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 Good work. Amen. Yeah.